everyone, it's Christina Herrick with The Packer, here with another Tip of the Iceberg podcast. In this episode, I'm talking with Todd Fryhover, president of the Washington Apple Commission, who had recently announced he's retiring um, and in the fall. And so I, I want to talk to Todd about his career and what he's seeing with the, the Apple industry. So thank you so much for joining me, Todd. My pleasure, Christina. It's nice to be here. Absolutely. And I, I know we've probably talked um, in my previous go around in the produce industry, but it's kind of exciting to have you now where, you know, I've seen some changes, you've seen some changes. But but I think what I want to start with is how did you find yourself in the, in the apple industry? How did you get started? Right. Well, that's really kind of easy. When you grow up in Wenatchee, well, yeah. <laughs> if you, if you look at the state of Washington and you put your finger right in the middle, that's us. You know, we're really an ag community. So it's it's kind of really all that I knew, you know, growing up with apples, pears yeah. and cherries and seemed like a natural progression to go into the ag industry. Yeah, absolutely. So how, how did you find your way to the Washington Apple Commission? Oh, my goodness sake. No, <laughs> that may take a while to talk about. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I graduated from college with an ag degree and I came back and I started my career when I was 23 in a professional manner. I actually started working in the industry when I was 12. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> of course you did. Back then, no. you actually <laughs> abused minors at 12 years old and make them go to work making two dollars and 15 cents an hour but i've been in the industry for a long time obviously and and this is the thing that i've known my whole life the thing that i love and the nice thing about this industry is is really it's not about the product necessarily it's about the people that make the product that's what's made the career so nice absolutely um yeah you're right and you know i laughed when you said you started at 12 because I, I've done this enough and I've talked to enough of folks in the Apple industry or just in the ag industry and a lot of them start when they're really young. So uh, that's that's not uncommon for me, but I'm sure for some of our listeners uh, that might be a little surprising. Sure, sure. So, you know, being in, in the position you've been in, you've kind of seen the ads and flows of the Apple industry and obviously you're kind of coming from the perspective of Washington. Sure. So, you know, let's talk about what are some of the challenges you're you're seeing and, and how does how does the industry overcome some of those? Yeah, the industry is real challenged right now. I think in, in general, you can apply that yeah. statement to almost all of agriculture. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've been relatively isolated up here in Washington, you know, for the last, you know, up until about 10 years ago, we really didn't have any outside entities. You know, I could go and I could give a presentation to a rotary club or a school or you know, it didn't really matter. My starting line was, you know, we are family. We're a family business. Yeah. You know, that's that's changed dramatically. And with that has come a lot of capital, a lot of uh, interest and need to plant more varieties and, and high density plantings. And it's put pressure on, la on labor. You know, labor is by yeah. far the biggest issue for our industry and for our growers. So th there's just insurmountable challenges, whether it's trade barriers or tariffs or, uh, you know, pesticide issues, you know, the, the tools that we can use or can't use, how we use them. It, it's just a very, very difficult <laughs> a time to be a grower only. A very, very difficult time. Absolutely. And, you know, you sp you talked about trade and and I've I've been um, you know I've been with U.S. Apple on in, on the Hill and you know talking about some of the the trade issues. So, you know, what do you see for the future? Obviously, I I, I know there's some opportunities opening up, but it takes time to grow that back to what it might have been before. Sure. So, you know, talk about some of those um, international exports and and you know where Washington Apples fit into that. Sure. So Washington exports about a third of all their products to over 60 countries. So if we just start from there, that's somewhere around 30 million bushels, 30, 30 yeah. 35 million bushels. So we we are heavily dependent, you know, being on the West Coast, we're close to the ports of Seattle and Tacoma and Asia is just right around the corner. So exports are very critical for us. You know, the, if I go back and I look at the last two administrations, you know, we've had no help on trade and trade barrier relief. No free trade agreements at all. No bilateral agreements at all. I mean, we're pretty much on our own. You know, we realized four or five years ago that anything that goes offshore, we really can't control. 
And mm -hmm. there, but I will say that in every market, there's opportunity. There's always a, a group of people, a consumer that is willing to pay a little bit more for a better product. And that's what we are. We're a little better product. You know, we're not going to be the cheapest um, Apple that's out there because our costs are too high. Our labor's too high. Everything is just too costly. So uh, we have really turned our focus here at the Apple Commission four years ago towards what we call the home court. You know, the two places that we can impact the most, of course, are Canada, which is, I, I don't want to say it's an extension of the U.S. market, but in some cases it is from a varietal makeup standpoint. There yeah. is the new varieties. Cosmic Crisp is huge in Canada. You know, Honey Crisp, of course, is another variety that's going big in, in Canada. And they have a willingness to pay more money for our product. Uh, Mexico, of course, is, is another major contributor. And it's for a different reason. It's more of a an outlet to keep our inventories correct. Any variety, any grade, any size can go to Mexico. The consumers in Mexico are, are phenomenal. And we can ship, you know, between 10 and 15 million bushels there every year. Wow. So our focus is really focused here upon the home court, but always, always keeping a strategic eye to opportunities that exist in other countries like Vietnam and Taiwan and some of those areas as well. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I was just um, at CPMA mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it shouldn't have surprised me, but I was kind of struck to see um, advertising for Cosmic Chris actually in like on the monitors right. in the Vancouver airport. Right. You know, like that, Cosmic had a great showing at CPMA. So I, I saw that, but like, I was just, it kind of hit me. I walked past one of them and I went, oh my gosh. Did you see wow. our little astronauts wandering around? Oh, too? yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. They, yeah. uh, they greeted me one morning, which was kind of cool. They right. they were they had uh, some astronauts out even before you walked into the convention center, which right. I thought was kind of cool. Right. Yeah. So the Apple Commission is responsible for the international side. So we don't do anything domestically. That's yeah. another organization. But Canada has been our main focus. We've seen a few exports to other countries, but not enough to really have promotable volume. Yeah yet that'll come we're looking for yeah it. absolutely so mm -hmm. you know we talked about international so i want to talk about domestic obviously as as you know this this was a, a big year for apples um and i'm kind of curious because i've heard rumblings and obviously i haven't heard anything solid but you know do you how do you see you know the apple industry in the u.s working together just to kind of grow consumption you know it seems like cons everyone talks about growing consumption and it kind of right. seems like consumption is just what it is. Right. And there's a lot of great apples out there. So, you know, how can the industry work together to, to get more consumers to come to apples and kind of see what, what the industry has to offer? Yeah, that's a, Christina, that's a real good question. I know. And if you go back 20 years ago, the Washington Apple Commission, they had a presence in the domestic market. We had representatives all across the country. We had the retailer across the table and we talked about, OK, you know, how do we do this together? You know, How do we increase consumption? How do we increase sales? You know, for the last 20 years, we haven't had that. Yeah. But there's always been this thought process that we're always better together. And that singular voice, whether that is in the past Washington alone, or what has to be in the future is all U.S. producers, whether it's Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania, California, Virginia, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, whatever it is. I mean, we need to have a singular voice. We need to be talking to the consumer about, number one, these great new varieties that are out there. I mean, you just pick your taste. You know, if you want sweet, you go over here. If you want tart, you go over there. But the problem is, is nobody's out there really talking to the consumer about what they're purchasing. And they, if they don't know what they're purchasing and they go in and they have a great experience, which is key, you got to have a great experience when you go in as a consumer. You know, if, if you go in and you have that great experience and you go back to your store the next time, you're going, oh, well, was it that one or was it that one? one? <laughs> they kind of all look similar, right? Yes. You know, so I think that's the biggest component that we really need to address is from an educational standpoint, we need to get out there in front of consumers educate them about the different tastes and textures, and then, of course, reinforce the nutritional side. You know, apples are good for you. I mean, you're not going to uh, have a healthy diet without having some some apples in that diet. So 
I think that's starting to mesh right now. There's a group out there that is willing to talk across borders. You know, New York and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Washington State are, uh, they understand that consum- it's either a consumption problem or it's a supply problem. And nobody wants to go down the supply side. Yeah. Right, especially with venture capital coming in and planting more and more acres. So really focused on consumption. And, and there is a group right now that is is trying to take that uh, large task on and try to find a solution in the future. That's awesome. And that that's great to hear because, as you alluded to, and, and I said it in previous podcasts, and whenever I talk to anybody about apples, it it is really a unique opportunity for the industry because there is such a diverse um, set of offerings for, for anybody's taste, you know, and so that's really something I think the industry can capitalize on, you know, there's everyone's got their kind of flavors profiles they like, and, you know, now you hear so much about flavor profiles with younger um, consumers and produce and trying new flavors. Right. So it's, it's something the industry's got right in their back pocket. So it's great to hear that the industry wants to work together um, to kind of build that consumption. So you, you talked about apple varieties, and, and I think you started to talk about this, so I don't know if you have more to share. Is just that balance of new varieties and introducing new varieties while keeping some of the, the varieties around, like you said, Honeycrisp, that's, that was a new variety at some point, but now is kind of a, a tried and true for the consumer. Like, how do you balance all of that with new varieties and meeting demands and trying not to overwhelm the consumer how does how does all of that work well of course at the apple commission we're focused only on the international side christina so yeah. it's a lot more complex in the domestic market for sure yeah. uh, but in the international market you know there, there's nothing more iconic than red delicious yes I mean, red delicious has been around for decades right but red delicious is it's differentiable it's clearly a washington product it gets us in the door so yeah. we're never going to lose sight of mainstream varieties like Red Delicious. It's it's the one that opens the door for us. When it opens the door, we have to perform. There's no question about that. We've got to have the right varieties in hand and make sure that we understand the consumers and what the consumers want. Every market is unique into itself. It has a, a different characteristic as far as taste and flavor profile that they want. And our job yeah. is to understand that. And then when we do understand that, how do we work with retailers and importers to develop strategies to get those consumers to be able to choose our product and taste it? And a lot of that has to do basically with working directly with that consumer. And demos have always been a major component of what we do, but we have seen a huge pivot over COVID into digital programs and platforms as well. Now, those are a little bit more difficult to measure, especially when you're you know, 62 years old and you're trying to figure out what the heck do they want to do, <laughs> you know, yeah. but it, it does kind of all come together and it's combined in a layered approach to try to get that consumer to choose our product. So I think there's lots of opportunities and, and I can't really, for us in Washington, I can't really say enough how important it is to start with the mainstream variety before you start introducing all the new varieties. Yeah, whenever I look at U.S. Apple's volumes, I mean, that's one thing I always look at is is Red Delicious volumes, because like you said, that is something that is still, you know, it is still very popular. It, it it surprised me, but then it didn't when I first learned about that. But um, you're right. That's when when people draw apples, even even though the logo on your shirt is, is a Red Delicious. Right. And you know, they draw that typey red delicious. They don't draw like a round honey crisp or a Fuji apple. You know, they're drawing that kind of typey apple like a red delicious. And so that's obviously the first thing people come to mind. And and I, you're right. On an international scale, that's probably even a bigger deal. So that's and it's interesting to hear. But um, you know, it it does make sense to me to deliver that great quality red get in the door and then start explaining what other portfolio varieties you might have uh, to supplement that. Well, the challenge now, Christine, is the Red Delicious volume is decreasing. Yes. So what is increasing are these new proprietary varieties yep. or like Cosmic Crisp and Honey Crisp, yep. which, you know, these growers have, have invested sixty and $70,000 an acre. You know, they they can't subsist on $20 FOP no. fruit. They need to have 25 or 30 or 35 
And that's the challenge going overseas, you know, that we're not the only game in town. You know, Washington represents 3% of total world production. The U.S. is four. China is half. Wow. You know, the EU is three times the volume that we are. Eastern EU is one and a half times. So we really have to pick and choose, you know, where we ship these new varieties and target that high end consumer to try to get yep. that return back for the grower. And that's why going back full circle, the domestic market is so important because yep. we can, you know, consumers here can and are willing to pay more for new varieties and new tastes and textures. Yeah, so I didn't send this in the question, so I'm kind of going to put you on the hot spot, but I hope I will give you an out. and. So we've been talking about varieties, and I didn't even think to send a question to ask you what your favorites are. So I will say favorites, just in case you wanna you wanna add a couple there, and you don't want to go down down the rabbit hole and and uh, take anyone off that you might know for a long time. Wow. You know. I know, I know. It's such a stumper for everyone I talk to in the industry. I'm so sorry to do this to you. Well, it, it's it's more of a political suicide. I know, I know. <laughs> All right. All right. I've been asked this question a thousand times, and I've always come back to the because I kind of had to. The conclusion was, I like all the apples. Yeah. You know, and all I want is for you to eat one more apple. That's all I want. You eat one more apple. <laughs> all of our consumption problems. You know, but there are so many good varieties now. And I, I can't choose a proprietary variety because then I'm showing favoritism, right? <laughs> so yes. what I'm going to do is I'm going to hang my hat on Cosmic Crisp. And I'm going to say the Cosmic Crisp is, is my favorite apple. And you are the very first person that I've ever told who my favorite apple is. Well, if you want me to edit this part out, I'm happy to do it just to <laughs> save you from... Christine, Christina, what are they going to do? Fire me? <laughs> That's true. That's yeah, true. Yeah. I'm good with it. No, we're fine. All right. All right. I do know it's a tough question. And that's why I even thought the varieties, just in case you wanted to, to name a couple, just to save yourself. It, it's a tough, it's a tough question. I find it hard when people ask me, to be perfectly honest with you, because depending upon who I'm talking to and where they're from, right. you know, I, I do like a few. There's there's quite a few that I like. So it's it's not like I have a number one favorite, but it's it's a, it's not an easy answer anymore. Well, and I think for me, it has a lot to do with what time of the year it is. Also, yep, you that's know, very true too. Where I am, you know, if I'm if it's fall and I'm in the orchard, and somebody has picked their golden delicious and they've left a few on the tree, wow, I'm I'm going to go after a golden. If it's late in the season, I'm going to try to go towards those more. Uh, the varieties that have a higher density of uh, yeah. cells that, that are firmer, you know, and in the middle, I can have just about anything that I want. So it, it really kind of depends. But this time of the year, I definitely gravitate towards cosmics or pinks or, you know, something that has a real uh, strong cell structure. Okay. Well, that's a great answer. I, I think that was kind of, I, I'm sorry. To, I, I knew I was going to, as soon as I started the, telling you and prepping you for the question, I thought, this is going to be a tough one, and and I understand why. Right. So now we now we're into the fun questions. We're kind of done with the really really tough, hard future okay. where things. This is a, the fun stuff. So okay. you know, what's what's been one of your favorite memories about about your time here in the industry? Wow, um, you know. Oh I, goodness, I thought that would be an easy one for you. <laughs> I, I tell you. Um, Fond memories. I think that, you know, in, in my job, since I was 25, I had the opportunity to travel to foreign markets. And I've spent my career traveling around the world. I've been to over 50 countries um, in my previous life and then with the Apple Commission as well. And um, the fondest memories really come from engaging with those consumers in these foreign markets and, and telling them about all the new and innovative things that we're doing in the state of Washington and the new varieties. And, and I mean, I kind of look at it like I'm a salesman, right? But I'm not a salesman. Yeah. But you know, you could, the comment that I always have is, you know, I could be working for Philip Morris. And if you don't know who Philip Morris is, they make cigarettes, right? Yeah. But I don't, you know, I work for an industry that provides fresh apples. I mean, what a better job than that. So just that interaction with, with the importer, with the retailer, and then taking that back 
to industry. You know, I, I know every owner of, in the state. I know almost everybody on the sales desks in the state. I know a, a huge swath of growers. And I can just say unequivocally, you know, they're all out there trying to do the best job that they possibly yep. can. And it's my job to represent them. And I, I just hope that I've lived up to their expectation and I have enjoyed every minute of it over the last 18 years here at the Apple Commission, every minute. Well, that, that's a great answer. And and I know it is tough uh, when you've had so many unique and interesting memories and trips and experiences to really kind of pick one. I, I understand why, why you might not want to do that. Um, so, you know, is there anything else about your time that, that stands out or anything about the industry that stands out to you that you want to mention that, that I didn't ask about? Well, I just think that, uh, you know, when we look at the industry from somebody that's been in the industry now for, well, 35 years and plus, and you think about mm -hmm. crop volumes at, you know, 60 million bushels, and now you're talking about crop volumes at 140. You're talking about, you know, five mainstream varieties, and now you have 42 proprietary varieties in addition to your mainstream varieties. Yeah. You talk about the complexities of labor and trade and politics and competition within not only the world with China as the biggest competitor, but also within the United States itself. Yeah. You know, and you and when you go to some of these trade shows, what you see is, is everybody grows apples. I mean, it's pretty amazing, you know, how many people are really out there in the competitive side of the deal. So I guess I would just be telling you, I'm telling you, I am extremely thankful to have, have had this experience. And it has opened up my eyes from a, from a guy that, of course, you don't know Wenatchee, but eight miles away is Malaga. You know, for a guy that Malaga was a foreign country when he was growing <laughs> up, you know, until he's 25 years old, I didn't go anywhere. And I've been nowhere domestically in the United States of any kind of consequence at all. But then to sit here with you, you know, 35 years later and tell you that I've been to 50 countries and I've, I've met with, you know, consumers all over the world and I've taken growers everywhere around the world wow you for a redneck little country boy like me to have done that uh, i can't say enough about this industry and i would encourage anybody that is interested in in getting into the produce industry to take a, a real hard look at the at the apple industry whether it's here or california new york or michigan it doesn't really matter but there's just a group of good people here that are just trying to do the best job they possibly can and make a living and provide a high quality product Absolutely. And, and I, I definitely think, um, you know, I've, I've always enjoyed my time with, with apple growers. It just, it seems like a lot of people in farming are just down to earth. I mean, you kind of, I, I always say you go into business with mother nature and it's this, this, this way of humbling you right. in, in a, in a unique, because there's so much you can control, but then there's so much you can't and you just kind of have to roll with the punches. So, it's this interesting mix of wisdom, but also looking ahead to the future, because as you know, growers have to plan so far ahead for their next moves. So right. it's it's just a really unique mindset, I think. Um, and it's always been fascinating to, to interact with them. So yeah, I, I could see why, you know, exactly what you said, um, you know, just being in the industry is, is humbling and fulfilling at the same time. It's just kind of a unique experience. It is, you know, you really, if you're a grower, you have to be an optimist. Yep. But you also have to be a huge risk bearer. Yep. You know, you're putting millions and millions of dollars into your orchard before, you know, three, four, five years before you even produce an, an apple. I know. It's, it's, they're amazing people. There's no question about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they are. And, and we're so glad, we're so glad they're there because that's why we're having this conversation. If that's they were right. growing apples, you and I would not be having this conversation. That's exactly right, Christina. Well, you know, thank you so much for, for joining me today. Um, sure. I, it's been a, an absolute, um, pleasure to talk to you. I know we our paths have crossed before, but it's, it's always nice to actually formally sit down with someone and get to know them a little bit. Better. Oh, hey, it's my pleasure. No problem at all. And if I could be of any kind of help in the future, just let me know. Absolutely. Great. And and I want to thank the, the listeners for tuning in. And it, don't forget, if you like what you hear, you can catch new episodes of Tip of the Iceberg on your favorite podcast platform like Google Play, Spotify, Apple, and more. And that's a wrap for this edition of Tip of the Iceberg. 
brought to you by the Packer Produce Market Guide and Farm Journal. Join us again soon for more industry insights. Bye.